And like I said, we want to extend a special thanks to the sponsor of this next event, Captain Lou Maurer. He is the author of the children's book, Herman and the Princess Gull. It's a delightful picture book with a heartwarming message. When two unlikely characters find each other, they decide that friendship is better than instinct. Remember that wonderful feel-good moment when, for the first time, we see a tender, loving exchange between two animals? In Herman and the Princess Skull, it is especially heartwarming because the two animals would normally be life and death enemies. Herman was inspired by a true event on a lovely beach in Costa Rica. The author includes the backstory at the end, lending a nice educational touch to the cast of characters. Herman and Antares will melt hearts and become heroes of the sea for children everywhere. But be prepared. Your little ones are going to ask for this story night after night. So you can get on the pre-order list. This will be available in November at compassrosepressusa.com. We'll drop the link down below. Compass Rose Press USA. And you are muted, Anastasia. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, we are so fortunate to have sponsors like Captain Lumauer, and we're grateful to our speakers, without whom this festival would not exist. Included among those speakers are award-winning master storytellers and dedicated industry professionals that know the publishing world inside and out, like the two women featured in our next event, Caitlin Greenidge and Brooke Warner. For those of you watching on Facebook, we're going to be giving away books throughout the day, including 10 copies of Caitlin's book, Liberty, right now. Our behind the scenes tech guru Haley is gonna drop the link in the Facebook comment. So please look for it and register for an opportunity to win. And also a very quick reminder, there will be time for Q&A at the end of Brooke's interview with Caitlin. So if you have any questions, please also drop them into the comments field and we'll share as many as we can with Brooke and Caitlin. Awesome. Hey Brooke, I see you just came on. I'm now going to introduce the lovely Brooke Warner, who is the publisher at She Writes Press and Spark Press, president of Warner Coaching Inc. and author of Ride On Sisters, Greenlight Your Book, and What's Your Book, and three books on memoir. Brooke is a TEDx speaker, weekly podcaster of Right Minded, and the former executive editor of Seal Press. She writes a monthly column for Publishers Weekly. So thank you so much, Brooke. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Caitlin's debut novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, was one of the New York Times critics' top 10 books of 2016 and a finalist for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. She is the feature director at Harper's Bazaar and a contributing writer for the New York Times. Her writing has also appeared in Vogue, Glamour, The Wall Street Journal, and elsewhere. She is the recipient of fellowships from the Whiting Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Liberty is her second novel. Caitlin, your voice is so powerful and beautiful. And is that true? Is that your second or third novel? Your second novel, yeah. It is a second, okay. We just appreciate you so much for being here. Thank you both. Uh, so to start, I thought we'd start with talking a little bit for people who are less familiar with the book about the era in which it's set, which is Reconstruction, and also that the book is based off, well, Liberty's mother is based off of a real life person, Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, who was a doctor during the Reconstruction era. So I wanted to ask you about uh, how you first found out about her and whether you immediately knew there was a novel there. Sure. Um, so, as you said, the book is based on the life of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, um, and she was the first Black female doctor in New York State. She was practicing um, in the 1880s and 1890s, and she grew up in a community called Weeksville, which was a free Black community founded in central Brooklyn in, the eight, in 1838, so 11 years after the, end of the official end of slavery in New York State. Um, and I worked at a museum called the Weeksville Heritage Center, which was dedicated to preserving the history of Weeksville and the stories of the people who lived there and founded it. And um, the people who founded Weeksville, uh, Central Brooklyn at that time, it would have been considered like really undesirable tract of land, uh, because if you can imagine in the 1830s, uh, Brooklyn is really undeveloped, it's, it's mostly farmland. Um, uh, where Weeksville was, was pretty far from the waterfront, so it wasn't really connected to the commercial center of Brooklyn. Um, this group of Black men got together and they bought this tract of land and they divided it into smaller lots because at that time in New York to be able to vote there was a, um, a requirement of a certain, you had to 
own a certain amount of land. So they um, divided these lots in basically the minimum amount of land that you would need to register to vote. And then they advertised to other black men throughout the uh, Northeast in black newspapers saying, come to Weeksville, we're gonna build this community here. We're building, we're intentionally building this black voting block to eventually enter into the political life of New York state and sort of steer the destiny of uh, black people here. So um, because it had sort of that push behind its creation, it, it, it attracted a whole bunch of people and it was home to its own um, newspaper, its own school. Um, uh, abolitionists were really drawn to the area, but then also just working class black people as well were drawn to the area to live there. Um, and uh, it was a really remarkable place. The history of the whole place is really sort of stunning. And, and um, from 1838 into the 20th century, it's just been a, a, a sort of like a hotbed of really sort of interesting intersections of American history. Um, and when I worked there, I was really lucky to work on their oral history project. And so one of the things that we were doing was we were interviewing people who had a connection to Weeksville, either um, they were a descendant of one of the founders or they had somehow had some sort of connection to the museum. And so we interviewed this woman named Ellen Hawley, who's a, a soap opera actress. Some people may recognize her name from, um, she starred in One Life to Live in the 1970s. And um, she's also a really wonderful historian. She wrote a memoir of her family history called One Life that um, traced her family history from um, the early 1700s through into her own uh, life growing up in New Jersey. Um, and she told us the story, uh, she was a descendant of this woman, uh, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, who had grown up in Weeksville, whose father, Solana Smith, had been one of those men who um, bought the, the lot of land and, and, and divided it up and sold to other Black men. Um, and she told us the story about her, her ancestor, and I was expecting her to sort of tell us about this doctor. But um, of the many stories she told us, she told us this really remarkable story of the doctor's daughter, her own grandmother, this woman named um, Anna uh, McKinney Holly. Um, and Anna was uh, Susan's daughter and she married the son of the Episcopal Archbishop of Haiti. She moved down there, um, was really sort of uh, fell in love with the city, uh, with, the, with the town of uh, Port-au-Prince and the country of Haiti. Um, but her marriage sort of fell apart very quickly and her mother helped her escape this, what ended up being becoming a, a pretty abusive marriage. Um, and so Ellen Holly told us the story and was sort of like it was, she, she really framed it in this wonderful way where she was pointing out both the courage that it would have taken to leave an abusive marriage in um, the the early 1900s, because um, that's the time period that um, she was getting that that the the story actually took place in. I fictionalized it and aged it back a few years, but um, the actual true story took place in the early 1900s. So she said, not only would it have taken sort of this courage to leave um, this marriage at this time period, uh, but also to leave it because she was a part of this very particular black. Uh, 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 social class of black people, um, you know, the talented 10th, sort of like the upper middle class and upper class uh, black elite um, who had this very sort of particular notion of, of how and where you were supposed to be and sort of um, inhabit blackness. And so to leave this family meant not only was she leaving this abusive marriage, but she was also essentially, um, uh, for many of her peers, uh, sort of looked at it as her uh, giving up on, on uh, ideas of blackness and sort of bringing shame to her entire race. So not only was she sort of dealing with the dissolution of this relationship and, and all of that felt, all that sort of pain that that felt like, she had most of her peers around her and definitely her in-laws who for the rest of her life sort of wrote her letters saying this, telling her that she was um, basically upholding white supremacy, sort of like bringing shame shame to every black woman everywhere by um, not staying in this marriage. Wow. And so Ellen Holly was sort of like, this is a really wonderful um, story. And I, I, I just sort of really um, admire my ancestor for doing this and for having the uh, strength to do this. And I was so struck with that framing of it. And I knew right away that if I ever um, got a chance to write a novel, I wanted to write about that. Well, that's the amazing backstory. And I wanted to ask you about the complexity of the character dynamics in particular with the mother and Liberty, your your protagonist, and also Emmanuel, who is the the Haitian who she falls in love with, but clearly <laughs> the complexity of these these two 
particular characters and how they interact, um, you know, Liberty and her mother and Liberty and Emmanuel. Uh, when I was reading it, I just felt like you must have some secret psychology degree because it was so emotionally wrought. And also Liberty is reactive sometimes, you know, and sort of makes these impulsive decisions. And then you know, you're very much in her mindset of her regrets and all kinds of other things. And so I wanted to ask you about that in particular, you know, just the rendering of not only a complex character in Liberty, but I think in particular with character dynamics, because I think that's so important to fiction. And one of the things that a lot of novelists, you know, either don't do as well as you do, or sometimes I think maybe don't even know how to do. So what's your, you know, how, what's your approach to that? Um, you know, I think it's just being as close to your characters on the page as you can and just really thinking through every decision that they're making and um, really sort of tracing the decisions that they make back to some sort of emotional logic. So emotional logic is very different than intellectual logic or, um, you know, like mechanical logic. Emotional logic um, is going to sometimes make your characters do things that are infuriating or um, things that don't make sense to the other people in the in the book or, or things that are, um, you know, inappropriate or, um, you know, that word that everybody uses problematic, like emotional logic leads characters and, um, and, you know, people in the real world to make decisions that are messy. And so when you start to really think through the emotional logic for your characters, you can really sort of um, figure out how to bring them to life on the page. Thank you for that. Um, you know, reading your book, did remind me of Toni Morrison in a particular way around the magical realism. And I saw later the New York Times mentioned Beloved, and then I read an, a, a rumpus interview that you did where you said, you know, Toni Morrison, in fact, didn't inspire this book. But I did want to ask you about the, the magical realism part in particular, uh, especially how it shows up with your character, Ben Daisy, who I want to ask you about in a second. Um, it was so unusual and also really striking. And I wanted to ask you about the role of magical realism and spiritualism in the novel. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted to, the novel is in part about sort of like um, how and if people can heal from really big, huge sort of like uh, generational level traumas like like slavery or, um, or freeing yourself from slavery or um, living through an era like reconstruction. So what does that look like in the micro level and in the personal level when you're just trying to either survive or sort of heal that, heal um, and live through that. And one of the sort of biggest coping me mechanisms is spirituality is how people um, order the world and explain to themselves how they think the world is, is working and why certain things are happening in the world around them. Um, so the magical realism in the book, every sort of fantastical thing that a character sees or experiences can also be explained through their psychological state, um, which I think is probably pretty common for, for how um, people experience those sorts of things. You know, I'm, I'm really sort of drawn to a lot of people who use magical realism in their writing say this, but I think probably the most famous person who says it it gets quoted most often is Gabriel Garcia Marquez, where he points out that everything that um, is read as magical realism in his novel is just things that actually happen when you're living under a system like colonialism or post-colonialism or, or dictatorship, you know, when you're living under these incredibly oppressive and sort of violent and um, really, really tortured kind of systems, um, strange things happen and you are, um, and it's sort of, the uh, a f another form of, of colonization that the the sort of larger framework tells you that it's impossible for those things to happen or um, uh, you know whatever happened you must have been sort of making it up or or, or sort of dreaming about it um, mm -hmm. and then the other part of it is that the book does take place partly in Haiti um, and I did not want to sort of fall into the cliche of describing voodoo in like a really sort of like um, just inauthentic way. So I've tried to read as much as possible about um, sort of the theories around um, voodoo and, and why people practice it and why people come to that tradition. Um, and what was really helpful was realizing that it's, it is a tradition of healing and, and it's all about um, making sure and trying to repair ruptures in communities and ruptures in community relationships really interesting. Um, I, I mean, I think it's impossible to write about the past without 
bringing up political ideas and things that were happening. And you've talked mm -hmm. about the parallels between reconstruction and now. And so I do want to ask you a political question, especially because we're in this moment of such incredible backlash, you know, and people trying to demonize these more complex renderings of history, you know, like with fake critical race theory ideas. And, um, you know, you're in this situated in this place where you're writing about black history at a time when people are trying to push back on what black history really was. And I I'm curious from your standpoint as a novelist, you know, I sometimes think that novelists can work around that, you know, because they're bringing, they're packaging it as a story and maybe therefore it's not so threatening to some people who are in this, you know, kind of twitchy space around these conversations. So do you think of that when you're writing fiction? I mean, does it come to you as sort of a point of intention or is the real intention just to render the story as true as possible? Um, it's both of those things because the fiction doesn't work if you're not trying to write it as sort of emotionally true as possible. And if you try and um, put sort of like a preconceived framework around it, um, it, it fails as a fictional project. But in terms of like the overall decision to write a historical novel at this moment, you know, um, the parallels between today and Reconstruction are, are very high. And, um, you know, many of us are not even able to really understand the depths of those parallels because so much of the history of Reconstruction, we don't really learn about either in high school or even really in, in college. A lot of us, you really, you really have to seek those stories out very, um, very intentionally to find out what was taken from us during Reconstruction from all of us, uh, Black Americans and non-Black Americans, um, to really figure out sort of like the death of democracy that happened for a hundred years um, in that period. Uh, and we don't really get to understand or, or frame it that way. And, and because of that, um, we don't even know what we're supposed to be asking for in this moment, you know, that we can ask for so much more because um, we had it for like a really brief uh, period of time. Um, so I, I want to um, sort of really bring that into light because I do think that there is a, a certain um, thing to be said about how we move forward if we have bigger things to imagine and if our imaginations are sort of really stuck on one very limited story about how things have always worked in the past then it's hampering us from being able to come up with really bold solutions that we need right now for our present day to make a better future that's beautifully said and it, it reminds me of some of the things that you wrote and said about haiti because and, and you can fill in the the gaps here a little bit for me because haiti was there was this kind of great hope for haiti that it would be this self-governed black country and it sounds like you know that that was part of what was so intriguing and influenced the novel um and i mean what a moment that we're in with haiti now you know i mean it just i was when i was reading your book you know all of this stuff with the assassination of the president was happening and all of a sudden resurfacing was all of this history of Haiti that I didn't know, mm -hmm. you know, in the ways that they were oppressed and had to pay the French back all of this money. And, um, and yet, you know, when you're talking about hope, I think there was this real aspiration that Haiti would be this thing. And so now that you've talked about the history that influenced the book, I, I still hoped you might say something about the Haitian part of the novel and, and your own visit to Haiti. Yeah, I mean, I think what I just, I, I was so struck by when I was doing my research was how many um, Black Americans uh, looked to Haiti throughout the 19th century and into the into the early 20th century, you know, like Zora Neale Hurston famously um, was really interested in Haitian culture and traveled there and wrote a wonderful book about it. Um, and how much um, that knowledge of that history and particularly the story of the Haitian Revolution was so inspiring and also um, terrifying to um, people who were invested in the system of slavery, but really inspiring to people who were looking for a way out of it. Um, and for a hundred years, you know, that was really inspiring. And it's kind of um, uh, astonishing how it it has disappeared from, <laughs> from cultural memory right. in that way. Um, and uh, I, I, so I really just wanted to sort of explore that part of it. And, and um, you know, the story of Haiti is, uh, is intricately linked to the story of the U.S. because we are so sort of close by each other and the U.S. has intervened so many times in, in Haitian politics and um, sometimes really disastrous ways. And so, um, you know, I just really wanted to open that up 
because I think when we, the books that we read in English um, about Haiti or has been, have been published here, oftentimes really sort of ignore that history. One of the things that I found out when I was researching the novel that was up until I think 1990, Haiti published more books um, per capita in their country than we did here in the US. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, so little of that gets translated into, into English for us to read. And it's, it's just so fascinating to me that, that a country can be so close to us and we, so, so geographically close to us, so intricately linked into our history and our foreign policy and how our country has defined itself. And yet the average American knows nothing about it and thinks that we have nothing to do with it. Um, and so I just was really struck by that. And then also the idea that, you know, Liberty is extremely naive. And so she sort of has romanticized um, the country of Haiti into this promised land. And then when she actually gets there, she's sort of forced to reckon with what it actually means to, to live in the, in the actual country there. Um, <clears throat> And in terms of visiting there, I was lucky enough to go in um, uh, February 2018. Um, and it wasn't for long, it was just for a week or so. Mm -hmm. um, and I visited Port-au-Prince and Jacmel. And um, I fell in love with Jacmel. Originally this book was gonna be set in Port-au-Prince, but um, when we got to Jacmel, I was like, oh, it has to be set here. Mm -hmm. um, which is, a, if anyone has ever go gets a chance to go, it's a really lovely place, especially during, during Carnival. Um, when you walk down Commercial Street in Jacmel, it looks literally exactly like Bourbon Street in New Orleans. It's like you are, you've been like photo, like <laughs> Photoshop, like into <laughs> Bourbon Street. It's, it's the architecture is just, it's exactly the same, which shouldn't be surprising, but it is kind of like, wow, this is like truly um, uh, uh, very similar. Um, and Jacmel is also, has always had like a really big connection with the East Coast of the US because there used to be um, a cruise line that went straight from Brooklyn to Jacmel, Haiti like three times a week up until like the 1950s or 60s. Um, so um, yeah, I just, I really love that part of the country and um, Haitian history is super fascinating. Haitian literature is so rich. Um, you know, I just really encourage, uh, you know, people, I, I'm assuming since everybody's at a writer's festival, super interested <laughs> in books and reading, um, seek it out as much as possible because anything you think you know about the country is it's, you do, do not know, you just keep, finding more and more as you sort of read, read further. <clears throat> yeah, well, and, and people can start with your book <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. a little entryway into it and then go from yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, the, it struck me that Liberty's struggles when she's in the United States, which is the first part of the book, seems to be more sort of race-based. And obviously probably because when she goes to Haiti, it's, it's a black country. And so then her issues are very much about being a woman, mm -hmm. you know? And so there's this oppression that she faces for her blackness here, you know, here <laughs> in the States. And then her, her femaleness, you know, when she gets there and it's, it's very interesting interesting because of course she's raised without a father you know she's surrounded by women and then she gets down to Haiti and there's the oppression of these men um did you set that up as a contrast I mean were you thinking did you kind of have wait till you got to Haiti to explore sort of the more female oppression or I wondered how that played into how you thought about her experience um, I think she's experiencing as a black woman throughout, you know, she sort of is experiencing um, a version of, of uh, black patriarchy when she even when, when even though she lives in sort of her mother's household and her mother is incredibly sort of privileged and powerful black woman for the time, she's still sort of um, seeing how her mother is um, really sort of diminished by the pastor in town, um, how she's sort of distrusted mm -hmm. by the other women because she doesn't have any connection to um, other men um, and how much her mother is um, really invested in this idea of herself as a pioneering woman and can't understand um, the complexities of color that um, Liberty is experiencing as much darker skin than she is. So her black womanness is is throughout the novel. It just sort of looks different in different mm -hmm. contexts um, because you know we are all. Um, I think oftentimes when we start to talk about sort of like systems of oppression, um, when you first learn about them, I think as as a like a young person, often it's very easy to get into this idealistic idea of like there must be some place that's going to be completely free of all of this, and I can just sort of find this place that's going to be completely free, or I can create this place that's going to be completely free of all of this, and maybe maybe that means that I move to 
you know, an all women commune or something, or maybe that means that, like, <laughs> I decide I'm going to go whatever. And, and, you know, the, the truth of it is once you get to those spaces, um, you know, the systems of oppression still exist. Everybody who lives in them were, were raised in the same culture you were and find ways to um, still continue some sort of form of oppressions um, that can fester and really um, become really unpleasant if no one's able to um, name them or sort of call them out if everyone's sort of like, but we're all women here, so there must not be any oppression because we're all women, right? Like, you know, right. it, it sort of, um, uh, uh, it will fester anyways. And, and the same thing is happening when she goes to Haiti. She's with these um, Black American expatriates who have ex specifically moved there because they have this sort of idea of creating this uh, Black Mecca of freedom. So they have a very romanticized idea of the country when they get there and they're not willing to let it go or to even adjust at all to um, concern with the actual Haitians who live there around them, right? Like they're they're so sort of committed to this idealist dream that they can't even actually interact with the people who, other black people who live around there because it's gonna really shatter that dream if they actually sort of engage and um, figure out their relationship to them. Oh, thanks for that clarification too, because I think it's important. There is probably a tendency to sort of silo those experiences. Um, but I, I actually did have a, a question that segues to it because it's a kind of a culture question. I mean, I couldn't help, but obviously, you know, it's like you're, you're tackling such massive themes and like this moment that we're in is just like so powerful. And I think, um, you know, I was thinking about the these that this is actually a powerful moment for black women and their voices your voices rising to uh national like the the, the top of national discourse you know because i was thinking like uh, recently with Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka just saying like, nope, we're not doing this, mm -hmm. you know, with Black women spe speaking out about voter suppression, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones and what happened at Chapel Hill, and even Meghan Markle, you know, being mm -hmm. like, no nope, to the royal family, right? So I wanted to ask you about that because your book has these incredibly powerful female characters, obviously incredibly powerful black female characters. And so I feel this moment of black women leading the charge in this moment of saying like, we've had enough and people I actually think are listening. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I am curious if you feel that as well. Um, I think it's like a continual conversation that has sort of like always been brewing around. I think what's mm -hmm. super interesting is this shift away, this this um, shift into being interested in saying no and figuring out how to, to divest yourself from certain systems. That is the thing that feels new to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is really powerful. You know, I think that in the, in it's it's funny to sort of track where sort of ideas come from and where certain philosophies come from. And I, I think there was a real, um, like in the last five years, real, uh, a bunch of people writing and sort of thinking and trying to come up with uh, some other solution besides um, really sort of like knocking on the door of a, of a institution or a place that actively has told you they don't want you. Right. So like the idea of like, well, what do you do next? And, and the real reckoning that came with Trump's election of like, oh, oh, we are really not wanted. Like, really, you don't want us. Like, it's not like, oh, you know, if you just dressed a little nicer, or, you know, um, worked a little harder or made a little bit more money. It's like, no, on all every circle level, they don't want you. They don't want us. So what do we do with that information? Um, you know, and I, I, I think the idea of sort of let us divest from um, wanting an entryway into this and, and hopefully the next step of, of that is sort of once we get the chance to to sort of rest from all of that, the next step from that is like, how can we build something um, for ourselves and for um, that that looks better and more humane and um, and it actually serves more people's needs than this these systems that um, we've been told we should be trying to integrate that really serve very very few of our needs. Hmm. Thank you. And, you know, I've, I have a publishing question for you. I've, I've interviewed uh, a few authors on this question, you know, Tayari Jones and um, Disha Filia and Kiese Lehman, you know, all of who s spoke to this idea that they, speaking of like kind of saying no, you know, mm -hmm. that they are being like to the publishing industry, I'm not writing for white people, you know, and I think that there's been this historical burden on black authors, like that you have to somehow write with a white audience in mind. And I 
I do feel a noted shift and um, like I'm witnessing, you know, like within Bookstagram, like black order, black authors supporting black authors and just being like, we got this, we are a giant reading block. Um, and I'm curious if you felt any pressure to write for a white audience or whether you kept any, you know, who, if you, whether you even kept an audience in mind. Um. I don't think, I think if the pressure for writing for a, a white audience, um, I mean, I think I, you know, there are moments where like in, in a certain reaction or whatever, it feels like there is a white audience misunderstanding stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean like I'm, feel like I'm writing for a white audience. And I think many of the pressures, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. I think the pressure to write for a white audience was, came from internal for myself, from the sort of the idea that, you know, like if, if, we can just write and and um, like maybe like 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of black authors would say sort of on book tours, like I'm writing to show that black people are human. I think I've mm -hmm. even said that in the past when I was a, a, a like a baby writer, um, sort of <laughs> writing about stuff. And that to me is sort of like the internalized idea that you have to write for a white audience because um, it's obvious to ourselves that we are human. So even that is sort of like setting up for yourself a goal that is not entirely authentic to yourself. Um, when you start writing with that goal, then when you do get um, sort of like feedback back on a piece or a reaction from an audience about the piece that is very much from the white gaze, that means that your, your reaction to that reaction looks a lot different than if you sort of start from the vantage point of like, I'm writing for myself completely. Mm -hmm. um, for this book, it's written first and foremost for black women. Um, that was like very intentional when I was, when I was writing it. Um, and I'm really glad and happy to see that it's resonating with other people as well. Um, but the, the sort of like love letter in within the book is to um, black women, black mothers and black daughters um, and sort of uh, figuring out how, what it means to inhabit all those different roles. Uh, another great segue, because I did want to ask you about motherhood. I know your daughter was born shortly after you finished the book and people have asked you, I read a bunch of interviews, obviously, <laughs> in, in preparing for today. Um, and I saw tons of information about your daughter and about being a mother. And I'm obviously really interested in that. And it's super cool that you had a daughter during the writing of this book, but uh, not much that I could find about your own mother. And I was wondering how you were influenced in thinking about Liberty and her mom in regard to being a a daughter more so than being a mother um it's funny because uh i don't know that it really influenced that much you know i i read as much as i could as, as many novels as i could about mother-daughter relationships and um motherhood and just and also a lot of uh writers sort of writing about motherhood because the entryway for me since i was writing it when i had not um, I, I did have my daughter when I was writing it, but the first and second draft of this book was were were finished before she was born. So she was really only I was really only uh, in the role of mother when I was doing sort of edits at the at the end of it. But for the mostly <laughs> imagining conceptualization of it, I was nowhere near motherhood. So um, I read as much as I could, um, particularly from writers uh, who are mothers who are writing about motherhood because. Um, Dr. Sampson in the book is a mother who is as dedicated to her child as she is to her, her own personal ambition. And so I was trying to find um, as many different models sort of of, of people who are that invested in both of those roles. Um, and I wasn't trying to read as much um, books or, or novels or um, artists who had found like a really sort of like tragic conflict between those two. I was trying to find people who, um, uh, found some sort of not balance, but like were able to hold both those roles in their in their life, even if it was very tenuous. So it was really helpful. Mostly, I was reading. Um, uh, there's a really wonderful book called "A um, Hundred Essays I Didn't Get to Write" by Sarah Rule, who's a playwright. Um, and they're just really short micro essays that are like a, two paragraphs long. And the reason why they're that short is because she had twins and she was trying to sort of write this book after she had um, twins. And the only very long essay in the book, it's about like maybe 20 pages long, is when she talks about um, her birth 
experience, which was wow. very difficult. And um, she had birth complications and she had Bell's palsy after she gave birth and she didn't write for a long time. And um, it's it's sort of like, a I recommend it to anybody who is a writer because um, and not only is it really wonderful uh, craft lessons on, on plot and structure, but it's also this very long um, essay at the end that is basically sort of like um, writing and life are, are they, they should not be in competition with each other. Your life is your, is your writing in one way or another. Even, even when you're not writing specifically autobiographical stuff, the fact that life happens to you and you are, you are a writer is not like a bad thing. It's not something to run away from. That's how it's supposed to work. Like you're supposed to live and experience things and, um, and bring it back to your art. And it's not actually detrimental to you if you um, are, are experiencing something as big and complex and, and potentially um, time consuming as parenthood um, that will come back to you in your in your art eventually. Um, and so that was really helpful because um, I was not pregnant at the time, but that was really helpful in, in thinking about this um, character, this doctor who would be as dedicated to her um, career and her vocation as she would to her daughter. Well, Caitlin, I have one more question before we're going to pivot to audience Q&A. So I do just want to give a little uh, notice to folks to start putting in questions. Uh, so there's a great opportunity to hear whatever Caitlin might say. You've had such wonderful answers. So thank you for that. Uh, I, I just wanted to give a nod to your first novel that came out in 2016. And it was very well received. Uh, I saw one of the major news outlets called it explosive. And I was curious, what is it like, you know, when you're a debut novel? novelist and you have a very well received book and then you have to think okay there's this pressure inherently that comes with doing book two and maybe doing as well um how did you approach that experience for writing liberty um i mean i think because the book you know, the book was well received, but it wasn't a bestseller um, and it got nominated for awards, but it um, won very few of them. So it didn't really feel like a lot of pressure because it was sort of like, okay, well, that book, it was well received, but like it, it feels like there's still stuff to do here. And I don't feel like I'm, I'm sort of like, um, you know, I, it, I've, I'm very happy with how the book turned out because it totally changed my life around. And, um, you know, I, I was able to apply for fellowships to be able to actually write um, full time for a few months at a time, which I'd never been able to do before. So I don't want to like pretend like it wasn't um, really wonderful because it was, but it also felt like there was still space to prove myself around certain things. And then also just um, with uh, Liberty, it was, I really sort of came up with a number of craft puzzles for myself that I wanted to sort of solve for myself on the page. And so that was also the thing that really helped me pull through because it was just focusing on the project, which was like, how do you write about a country that you've never been to before in, in a language that you do not speak <laughs> for a time period, a hundred years removed from yourself? How are you going to okay. solve that problem? And um, when you're focused on that, it's really easy to sort of um, keep moving because you're trying to figure out as many sort of fixes to that as you can get to. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty exciting because obviously you're talking about like this intellectual challenge and it's an emotional challenge. I mean, it's um, just incredibly well executed. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, questions are starting to come in. So I will ask those. Donna says, well, <laughs> a small question. What are your thoughts of the state of publishing right now? Uh, <laughs> Maybe you could answer that in a small way. <laughs> um, I think publishing is in a potentially really exciting place. Um, you know, what is not exciting is we're seeing sort of the um, conglomeration of a bunch of publishers into really sort of these big mega houses. That's very scary for the future for writers. What is exciting is that um, we are also seeing a whole bunch of independent presses pop up. We're also seeing independent presses um, publishing really sort of um, amazing powerhouse books, and we're and we also are seeing a community of readers and writers who are able to support that independent work in a really dynamic way um, through social media that um, didn't exist maybe ten years ago. Um, so it's we're in a precarious place, but we are also in a place where there's a lot of I think um, you know if we can sort of move away from the doom and gloom, there's actually a lot of potential for um, really exciting things to, to happen. Um, and particularly, I think the rise of 
social media, the rise of things like book groups on Instagram and um, book talks on Facebook and, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, bookstores hosting online book discussion groups, all that kind of stuff to keep the conversations going around books and literature is super exciting in, in ways that are um, really dynamic and, and, inc and inclusive in a way that um, isn't possible with sort of just in-person um, organizing. Um, so all that makes me really hopeful for um, publishing because I think some of the um, power is being dissipated in a really interesting way. And I think sometimes what used to happen in the past before social media, where you could say sort of like, well, we're having a trend of like women's fiction, right? Like remember when people would be like, well, the trend this year is like books by women about, um, you know, lonely daughters or something like that. Um, I don't <laughs> think we can really talk about that anymore because people keep the conversation going online or in on social media in really interesting ways that sort of dissipate the whole idea of like we had a trend and we can't do any more books about you know lonely daughters because we had five of them last year like I don't know that those conversations still happen in that way which means as a writer that's very exciting because you don't have to worry about that necessarily part of of marketing that used to really I think make a lot of writers scared or trip them up or or feel like your project wasn't going to get sold in some kind of way. Well, and I think another thing that was happening was you would have these publishing houses that had no idea how to reach certain readerships. So like whatever that marginalized readerships was, it might, it might be black authors, it might be LGBTQ authors, whatever. And they're like, well, they're just not there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And it's like, yeah. well, just because you don't know how to reach them doesn't mean they're not there. And so what you're saying about the rise of social media, I think is so much that it's like, yo, we're here and we actually like have our own thing going on. And so then you have all these influencers, which is totally changing the face of it and is, and is really exciting. So yeah. Um, so that is cool. Uh, okay, a question from Anna. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you dreamed up? I mean, it sort of is the same question I asked, but how you dreamed up and crafted the mother-daughter dynamic. So, you know, I guess that was in part on the true story, but clearly Liberty had different aspirations than her mom, and that creates quite a bit of tension between them. Yeah, it was just reading, you know, as much as possible. So both reading um, history books, but then also um, fiction. So researching um, and, and finding as many novels that I could about mother-daughter relationships and then also looking for novels set in this time period to get a sense of the language and the um, uh, sort of like understanding of the world and also reading people's letters to historical letters um, just really reading sort of as far as possible for as many different examples to um, sort of pull from and model from and sort of spark ideas around. Awesome. Um, another question from Anna, which is about colorism. And I was curious about this too. I mean, Liberty clearly is very dark and her mother is so light that she can pass. And Emmanuel is also so light, right? And so Liberty's experiences are very different. Um, and you and clearly colorism is a, is a theme throughout. So what were you wanting to achieve, you know, just in terms of exploring that experience? Um, I just really wanted to, you know, it, I don't think I could written written about that era without including those experiences. And I wanted also to sort of show how um, arbitrary it all was, I guess. And also, I think, um, you know, in the there's a whole genre of, of books about passing. It was like a really popular uh, black fiction genre in the 19 teens and 20s. And so in, in most of those books, though, um, passing is sort of like this really um, tragic thing because it's because it's a novel so it's like a really dramatic sort of like tragic thing but when you read people's uh, memoirs and sort of letters around passing of the same time period and even into reconstruction going back a, a couple decades um, people oftentimes have like a really blasé um, uh, uh, description of it and would sort of describe like um, you know, I, I wanted to sit at the front of the bus that day. So I just sat there and no one was going to ask me because I looked like I was white, but I, I, I clearly am, I clearly identify as black or, um, you know, I wanted to get the good tickets at the theater. So I did, <laughs> I went into the white line and I bought them and, and then I saw my show and then I left and um, there, there wasn't really sort of like this hand wringing over it. Um, and the flip mm -hmm. side of that as well was that, um, you know, right after the civil war, this whole class of people that um, before the Civil War were considered people of color or free people of color, all of a sudden were classified as black because of the one drop rule and, and because of um, Jim Crow that, that came to have like very specific 
meanings and restrictions on your movement. And even though those people could have technically passed as white and sort of absented themselves from that whole struggle, many of them, probably the majority of them actually actively said, no, we are black people. We are putting our law in with black Americans in the US. We're gonna head up these um, civil rights organizations. We're gonna probably be the head of a lot of the churches and schools that are happening around here. And we're gonna try and organize our fellow black people. We are actively throwing our, 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 our weight over here and not with whiteness. That's mm -hmm. interesting to me. And I think that's probably um, really uh, unexpected for modern readers. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, Seema wanted to ask about your first line. And of course, in fiction, first lines are so important. So uh, for everyone who doesn't have the book right in front of them, like I do, I will just read it. It says, I saw my mother raise a man from the dead, which is obviously incredibly provocative. So she said uh, about your first line, you know, how do you recommend for writers that are listening to come up to think up a first line, think up a good first line? Um, I mean, that line totally came um, from out of nowhere. I mean, it came from after sort of reading and thinking really deeply about scenes and people for a long, for many, many months, and then sort of the line um, sort of came. So I think it you, you can't go into it saying like, I'm going to spend the afternoon thinking up first lines. I think you sort of have to really spend a lot of time with your characters with where you think the novel is going with some uh, with some assurance knowing you're knowing that the novel can change any minute um with what kind of scenes you want to put in and then um the lines sort of start to to come to you as you are more deeply entrenched in the world but i think when you start to try and um come up with things like um uh like overall fixes for sort of every creative thing it's it's not going to work in that way so from Itani, she says, I love how the book dives into the world of the dead and the near dead. How did you conceive of this part of the book? Um, that's a great question. So I was really struck by um, how often in uh, spirituals and uh, near spirituals, the idea of freedom and death is so intricately connected um and this which makes sense because you know they're they are songs sung and sort of like the oppression of slavery but um i i was really struck by sort of that idea um within uh black culture and black um religious life of the of the really sort of um, twinning of death and freedom and death and emancipation. And so um, knowing that this was gonna be a novel exploring all the different meanings of freedom, I knew there had to be a way to um, bring that meaning of freedom into it. And it was through um, these different relationships that the characters have with death and, and the dead and dying. It's made me think of, you know, the the opening line from your New York Times review was that this was a feat of uh, monumental thematic imagination. And it's so true because all these questions, they're pointing to all these themes that you tackle. Um, and, and it made me think of one other theme I wanted to ask you about, or at least one other uh, through line, which is about how you how you tackled sex. And I think that's a hard thing to write for a lot of people and people are very uncomfortable. And your scenes were like, tender and surprising and and complicated as well um so it makes me think of these emotional dynamics that i referenced earlier and you include a lesbian couple um that uh liberty kind of overhears their their sexual exploits um how did you i mean it's, it's the same question as as thinking about the the dead and the near dead how did you treat sex in the novel or how did you want it to be seen um, it was important that uh, Liberty enjoy sex, I guess, because I wanted the thing that sort of drove her and her husband apart not to be sex because that, that felt very sort of obvious and expected for the time period. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also, when I was sort of writing this romance between Liberty and Emmanuel, I was trying to figure out what sort of language they would use to express to each other why they're attracted to each other, um, because they fall in love very quickly. And so the the basis of their love, because because it is so quick, is mostly just physical attraction to each other. Um, and uh, I so I was reading, trying to figure out like what language would be true to the time period and to their social class and sort of all of the stuff that that entails while also being like based in the body and based in actual desire and, and really read that way on the page. And so 
I read um, the biggest model was uh, the Song of Solomon from the Bible, Song of Psalms. And I, I read that a lot over and over again. And I was really lucky in that I had a friend who is um, doing a, a new translation of that. She's a poet. And so she told me, and she's been researching all these histories of translation. And she was like, do you know one of the theories about that book of the Bible is that it's actually all about female desire. It's all about um, how you're supposed to have sex with a woman, whether you're a man or a woman. And it's all about sort of like how you're, you know, fisting and like using your hands and like all these, that's, that's all the metaphors that are within that is all of, it's queer sex. And so I was like, that is amazing. And so she was, we were talking about like all the lines back and forth. And I was like, well, this is just pointing me that I, I need to sort of come back to this language over and over again and figure out um, how all of these different characters, all the young characters in the book, um, Liberty, Emmanuel, and the, the Graces, these two women who are Liberty's friends and who are in, um, in love with each other, how they're all going to sort of navigate um, this text can sort of be a map to explain how they're all sort of living and sort of feeling these desires with each other because the book is about freedom and one of the freedoms that I did want to sort of um, explore was this sexual freedom that's open to um, uh, the characters in a, in a couple of different ways in the novel. I'm so glad you explained that because I did obviously Emmanuel's, the way Emmanuel has sex with her is not this incredibly like male forceful way it's so tender and beautiful and it's a really touching part of the book so um it's that's just really interesting to know thank you uh so a question from uh sorry Ina had another question <laughs> which is very sweet it says uh, I'm a new writer and I'm following your career right now I'm not get uh I'm getting good feedback like I know I'm on the right path but I'm struggling to be seen mm -hmm. did you ever feel that way Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, I would, you know, it's too bad we can't do like back and forth because I'm, I'm curious what you mean by, by struggling to be seen. But I think um, one of the things to realize as a, as a writer, especially if you're just starting out is like, there's a certain power that comes with not being seen as a writer for a while. Number one, you know, you, you want to really be working on your craft and your work to make sure that when you are being seen, you are ready and your work feels like something that you want to be able to stand up with and stand up beside five years, 10 years, 15 years down the line. Um, and the other thing is that when you aren't being seen, you have the freedom to really experiment and to try new things and to make mistakes and to um, do something really out there and to try writing in a style or a genre that you don't you thought you would never write in or to, um, you know, write about a subject that really, really, really scares you or write about a subject that you're afraid that you're family would read or all these sorts of really wonderful things come with um, quote unquote not being seen. Um, and I, I, you know, I, we were talking a little bit earlier about social media's impact on publishing, which has been wonderful. I think social media's impact on writing the, the, has been great as well. But one of the downsides is this idea that as a writer, you're supposed to have a quote unquote brand, whether that means just like, I'm going to brand myself as, you know, a sci-fi writer, or I'm going to brand myself as a writer who's interested in these particular things. And, um, that can be so limiting, you know, <laughs> like you're, you're an artist, you're supposed to be interested in everything in the entire world. You know, I, I just really want to like shy away from thinking about yourself and your work in that kind of way. Cause it's not our job as writers to think about ourselves in that kind of way. You know, the, the world is already going to label us enough. You know, we, we should be claiming the space of, I can, I, with, with hard work and intelligence and care and, 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 um, and really thoughtfulness, I can write about anything. Um, and, and the whole world is open to me. Um, and so I think when you are not being seen, um, you, you, the pressure to do uh, over around that sort of can fall away and you can just really follow your interests. Yeah, and that's a an super inspirational message. And I just want to say, Ina was able to weigh back in to say <laughs> specifically what she's talking about is that she's really having a hard time getting an agent. So, oh, this, okay. <laughs> well, but, but, but I think you're, you're the way you answered, I imagine, is helpful to everyone listening because yeah. it's both and. But what do you think about that? And I mean, you've published your uh, two books with the same press. So, you must have also had a very positive experience to, to continue on. Um, so yeah, more on, more on that. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, agents are tricky and it, it's hard to, um, navigate that. And I think, um, continually, I, I don't know. I feel like always sort of feeling like you're in, in agent searching mode 
can be really damaging to your work and to yourself. So I think being really intentional about, about when you're sending out and when you're initiating those conversations and when you're sort of saying, um, I'm actively not going to be searching for an agent at this moment and I'm actually going to be focusing on my work or, or not on my work. I'm going to be focusing on living life because I need a, a break because I feel like I'm going to get burnt out with writing and I'll come back to it, you know, in, in three weeks or six weeks or, you know, a month or something like that. Um, so I think being really intentional about when you send out so that you can minimize the, um, the, the rejection feeling or the anxiety around rejection is really helpful. Um, I know that when I was starting out writing, when with um, other people in my MFA, we would do like uh, a, a weekend where we would all get together and um, send out submissions all sort of at once and then just not do it for the rest of the year. You know, you just like do it in like this short period, period of time and then sort of like leave it, whatever shakes out of that. Usually it was nothing. Um, would we and then sort of like go back to doing your work for the rest of the year. I think doing that also helps you feel like you're a little bit more in control of the situation than just feeling like you are sort of perpetually on the market, perpetually sort of looking. Um, and then I, I don't know if that's helpful advice, but I'll- Oh my gosh, it's super helpful, Caitlin. Thank you. And I can see Jennifer's back on. So I think we're at the end of our time and I just wanna say thank you. You're an amazing writer and uh, really everyone out there read this book. It's fantastic. I can't wait to see what comes next from you. Thank you. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you both. That was Brooke Warner in conversation with Caitlin Greenwich. Thank you both. That was fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you, and Thank you We're so big much. fans and um, thank you, Brooke, Huge. for that wonderful interview. And thank you, yes, Caitlin. Thank you. Caitlin, your writing is um, mesmerizing oh, is the word yeah. that comes um, to mind and hope you come back and want to read of everything course. you write. Yes. Yeah. Yay. Thank yeah. <laughs> Thanks to the Have festival. Awesome. You guys are doing great. I can't wait to listen Brooke, to the Ari. So <laughs> thank, right. thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Caitlin. Bye. Bye. Bye.